Well, boys, looks like you start the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here today with Michael Kester. Oh my god, we are here today, aren't we? Michael, I have uh, two movies with built-in commercial breaks This for you. is just the best double feature ever, and they're by notable directors? They are by, uh, one might say, notable directors that double feature likes. Teen idols in leather jackets? Wow. Yeah, Teen Idols and Leather Jackets. We got a 50s thing going on. <laughs> we have um, notable vehicles. I this guess. is one of our most carefully constructed double features <laughs> we've ever done. It's, it came uh, so easily, too. It's 50s throwback time, and uh, by directors you might not expect that from. Um, we're going to do Road Racers, but before that, we have another film. Yeah, we're going to do Cry Baby. Now, Road Racers is a um, Robert Rodriguez film. Right, which we're not doing. We're doing that one second. We're doing yeah. the John Waters film first, which is Crybaby. And everyone's already confused. <laughs> we're going to spoil both of those films. The first film we're going to spoil is Crybaby. Uh -huh. There, and we fixed it. We fixed the yeah. order. Uh, everybody's seen Crybaby. It has Johnny Depp. It's a popular film, uh, I guess. <laughs> it's no. a John Waters film. Maybe you haven't it's seen it. It's popular for a John Waters film. However, uh, nobody has seen Road Racers. That's probably not true. Some people have seen I Road Racers. I think very few people have probably seen Road Racers. Uh, let's try this one. More people have seen Road Racers recently than, yeah, that's than definitely ever true. before. Definitely true. So you can actually get both of these movies now. Hooray. Check the films out before you uh, listen to the show. Or use the chapters to skip over those. Uh, or if you're just tired of Robert Rodriguez. Nobody is ever. I defy you, sir. <laughs> no one ever grows tired of Robert Rodriguez. Are you tired of Robert Rodriguez? No, just of tired in general, not. I think. Of course not. Just tired. Crybaby is a film from 1990, and uh, it's, of course, John Waters. John mm -hmm. Waters hasn't been, uh, hasn't been mentioned on our show in a little while. In a little while. Um, I want to talk about the people who are in this. Okay. Now, some the, of them... The, you mean the actors? Yeah. Okay. We have, uh, we've mentioned some of these people before. Yeah. Casting difference this time is uh, we're two years after Hairspray. This is our first film without Divine. It is. Now, uh, almost all of the Waters films we've talked about so far have had Divine in them. With the exception of, what, A Dirty Shame? Yeah. And Serial Mom. You got it. And so, um, so this is right after Divine died in, well, in 88, mm -hmm. uh, long enough, I guess, for John Waters to kind of regroup and yeah. having lost the, I mean, that's heavy because he started making films with Divine. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's not just, oh, the person who was in all his films. Right. That really, Divine remembers John Waters from a time when John Waters wasn't even really making films. Yeah. They grew up, you know, shooting bullshit movies together. Right. Uh, little shorts and stuff they kind of learned how to make films you know with each other and then divine dies and now it's time to make another film yeah it's weird when you're a filmmaker because i mean fucking sucks when anybody dies in yeah your life, that's awful that's right? a bad time but um you just kind of get back to what you do and what you do in john waters case was the thing he did with the person that died. Sure. So part of kind of his, I don't know, mental recovery there is, well, I got to get back to filmmaking. And it becomes interesting to see who he puts in that first film yeah. and what he makes that first film about. And it falls very much in line with the, the previous film with Hairspray. Yeah, it's very similar to Hairspray. Both dealing with, um, I mean, always dealing with taboos, but mm -hmm. dealing with these, uh, these groups that are sure. factioned apart. Uh, the authority figures that enforce that factioning. Sure, plus it's a period piece. Sure, you got that. And um, Ricky Lake is back. Very musical. Yeah, <laughs> Ricky Lake does come back. We talked about Ricky Lake extensively in Hairspray. She mm -hmm. had a very big role in that. Patty Hearst, we talked about uh, previously. Patty Hearst showed up more in Serial Mom. Didn't yeah. necessarily show up more, but we talked about yeah. her more in uh, Serial Mom um, pretty extensively. Convicted terrorist, uh, yeah. Patty Hearst, I should say, if you aren't. Familiar with Patricia's previous work. <laughs> it's terrorism. Um, yeah. And Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah. I want to say alleged terrorism, but she was actually convicted. So, however, you know, regardless of how you feel about her conviction, uh, that was something... I'm pretty sure she actually did time for it, too, didn't she? That doesn't surprise I me. I know she was let off eventually. Presidential pardon, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, crazy. So, we talked about that on Serial Mom. We talked about Ricky Lake on Hairspray. 
I uh, have not talked about uh, Iggy Pop. Uh, maybe in, as Ratface and Tank Girl. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> um, didn't talk about Iggy Pop. Who the fuck is Iggy Pop? Iggy Pop is the fucking greatest. Yeah? Iggy Pop. I don't know anything about Iggy Pop. He used to be Pop. the front man of the Stooges. Okay. In, uh, the, the, what? Yeah. Did For you real? not know that? No, I Oh, yeah. No Iggy idea. Pop is the singer of the Stooges. What are you talking um, about? And then he went solo. Uh, the Stooges had like two albums. And sure. Then okay. Iggy Pop became... It, that, it was... Two albums of the Stooges, then Iggy hits. Pop and the Stooges, yeah. and then just Iggy oh, Pop. Oh, okay, Iggy Pop and the Stooges. Yeah. yeah, that sounds familiar now. Um, but Iggy Pop, he's a notorious rock and roller. I mean, yeah. like the type of rock and roller that could eat a bowl of drugs sure. in the morning. <laughs> right. And that shows up in a John Waters film. Sure. John Waters kind of makes these these films where he goes, who would it be fun to hang yeah, out with? exactly. Oh, this would be really funny. Put this person in the movie. Yeah, he's he's notorious for being absolutely insane, for mm-hmm. rocking out way too much sure. to the point where it's <laughs> sure. scary to be around him on stage. Yeah. And for having done every drug ever known to man mm. and looking like a suitcase. Sure. <laughs> these right. are the things that Iggy Pop right. is known for. Um, but he, he's still uh, around. He's taking he's, a bath in this in yeah. a tub in this yeah, movie. Yeah, he's goofy. He um he looks like somebody who does a lot of drugs. Yeah. I mean, oh, he yeah. has this this impossibly fucking skinny skeletal sure. body, and he's just wired all the time. But he's a rock and roll giant. I mean, sure. he he's still he's still. He just came through Chicago not too long with the Stooges. Uh, they played at the Aragon. Ridiculous. He's still doing it. Still at it, man. Say that? Still at it. Tracy Lords also in this film playing yeah. uh, Wanda. Tracy Lords, um, convicted porn star. Well, convicted, just, <laughs> convicted porn star. I just feel like she has convictions. Oh, okay. uh, never convicted. Never incarcerated. Just a porn star. Sure. Um, made a lot of pornography prior to this film. I think this was actually her first. Um, fictional role i don't fictional? know fictional yeah no, porn guess... is far more realistic it's her first uh it's her first film film not porn film it's the first time she uh she acted without anything inside of her i feel like that might not be true man. that's true that that's, might... uh, that's she a did a lot of movies before this um you look at her she imdb get... and yeah. they're she didn't they're... get naked in this film okay there you go that might not you know pornography is a weird thing pornography is a weird thing doesn't you even require to you to be naked banking site I, I don't know anything Who about that. Who else is in this film? Kim McGuire is in this film. Kim oh, yeah. McGuire is Hatchet <laughs> Face. Uh, she's in this film as Hatchet Face, and she is in very little else, which is par for the course, and for, you know, for a lot of the actors yeah. that show up in John Waters stuff. So I know you're terrified of her. She is insane looking. I think a lot of things about Kim McGuire. I have a very confused opinion about her. But one thing that I can definitely swing in is that she was there to be divine. Yeah. I can't tell you whether or not I'm afraid of her, sure. and I can't tell you whether or not the makeup job was intentionally a horrible sure. disservice to her. <laughs> sure. Um, well, they write uh, they write a lot into this. I mean, think about her character's name. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of oh, the yeah. script focuses on a horse runs away from her. She's or a whatever. 3D monster. <laughs> I'm sorry, a cow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. She uh, and then seeing her play in a band is even more terrifying. Yeah, but she she's has, a hell of a she's a hell of a saxophone player. She is. She is. Because everybody's doing all their own singing and performing in this film, right? No, oh, <laughs> no, my definitely bad. not. Uh, actually, no one is doing. I don't even know if they're doing their own dancing at this point. <laughs> no, they're probably doing their own dancing. Uh, yeah, she's got this kind of Harvey Dent animated series makeup going wow. on there. It's just well, wow. you know what I mean, right? Yeah. The sort of lipstick sure. circle over this. Ah, oh, terrifying. I mean, if if the objective here uh, in a John Waters film is to have one of a kind actors, she certainly achieved. Oh yeah, uh, achieved that. I wouldn't have it any other way. But you're right; it does in the divine shaped hole left in this uh, in these films. This is one of the oddities we're we're bringing to the collection in hopes of still creating outlandish material. And you know what? You saw Divine's roles getting a little more. I mean, when we talked about polyester. There was um, kind of taking the backseat a little bit, a little more sure. normalized. She ate less bodily waste as the films went on. And then there was Hairspray, and Hairspray, almost a you know, a second-tier character, yeah. a supporting role, mm-hmm. playing a parent and, you know, thinking back, playing the station owner or whatever. Uh, not even in, in drag, not even cross-dressing in that right. part. Still looking and acting just yeah. as weird, but, you know, what are you going to do? A uh, weirdest role in a John Waters film always goes to the person with the least weird role 
or uh, the most notable actor because uh-huh. you look at the collection of carnies. Sure. And then you look at the, you know, people who grew up in the alleys of, of Baltimore suburbs, if there yeah. is such a place. And then you look at Johnny Depp. Johnny fucking Depp is in <laughs> Crybaby. You go, uh, Johnny Depp. How did you get here? Are you lost? Yeah, you, it's a weird... Let's get your map out and figure out what Hollywood movie you were trying to drive you to. Can, you can go back and look at every John Waters film. Mm-hmm. You can take the combined fame of every other actor in sure. a John Waters film, sure. and you barely make it to Johnny Depp's ankles. Yeah, Johnny Depp gets paid more than the budget of this film to be in a Pirates movie. You yeah, know oh I mean? yeah, <laughs> ten times over. It's crazy his level of stardom. It's probably hard to find, you know, you could collect actors from any group of movies and probably not reach the stardom of Johnny yeah. Depp. But uh, seeing him in a John Waters movie yeah, is... Yeah, it's, it's one of those... Un- it's, it's bizarre, but I mean, it's great. Even when Hairspray comes back around and John Travolta is in yeah. the remake of no the stage version of Hairspray, it still isn't as weird as Johnny Depp. So I always heard, and I don't know if, if you know if this is true or not, that he took this role at the time because he didn't want to be typecast. I've heard the same thing, actually, yeah. He was doing, what was the name of the TV show? 21 Jump Street? Yeah, it was a teen TV show. I actually don't know a lot about yeah, that. It's, Do you know I mean, what that it was? was? A teen, it was a teen drama. Sure. Um, I guess dramedy. Okay. Uh, along the lines of 90210. But, okay, sure, sure. Um, probably for younger people. And that was around the uh, the Killapalooza time? Yeah, it was right around Killapalooza. Uh, what was that, number two? Yeah, so um, what was he in? He was, he was in, in Nightmare on Elm Street. You got it. Because all... Famous actors start in a slasher film. <laughs> sure. And, you know, in Nightmare on Elm Street, it wasn't the bizarre thing that it is in Crybaby. Oh, yeah, not at all. It wasn't, all. oh, my God, Johnny Depp, he's so weird in this role. Right. You know, what is he doing here? Crybaby, it's like uh, he's weird and then they make the role even more awkward. Mm-hmm. Just, to, just so it's, um, you want it to be more bizarre when you show up to see it than it is on the one sheet. Yep. And, you know, I don't know how much truth there is to that, but probably it's not something to be highly skeptical of. A lot of teen actors do that. Oh, yeah. Look at popular, I mean, the Harry Potter kids yeah. all started acting in bizarre stuff sure, left and right. they all spun out. Although, I will say, and maybe we'll get it on the show at some point, but the woman in black, that hammer horror Daniel Radcliffe joint. Oh, I don't even know about that. So good. Oh, man, I don't even know about that. Such a good, I was so is happy. Is it weird, though? Is it making it was my bis- point? Yeah, well, because he, okay, so the thing is, is he's supposed to be an adult, you know? Sure. He's right. supposed to be a grown-up. He's sure. a father. But to me, he's always just going to be an 11 year old kid. Sure. Well, that's what he's trying to avoid. He's got a huge franchise under his sure. belt. And that's, I mean, and that's what Johnny Depp, I guess, was going for with yeah. Crybaby. And it's, it's a weird role because it's still such a, um, it's all about delinquents and right. being a juvenile. Sure. But it's, you know, there's a lot of adult themes and it's, you know, it's, it's the tame version of an adult themed film. Sure. It's not Dirty Shame. Right. But it still surpasses probably a lot of what was coming out then. Yeah, when you look at uh, the the more mainstream or more... um, The John Waters films that got a little bit more public attention, those tend to be some of my favorites because of the Trojan horse element. Yeah, the subversion. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're taking something like this that looks glossy and friendly, and who doesn't love Crybaby? Oh, yeah, no, it's... It's it's, as if you could show Crybaby to a a class of high school kids, and everyone would sign off on it, you know what I mean? Uh, but we're still getting in the same ideas as usual. You know, as we're talking about this, I'm thinking all the kids from that fucking vampire franchise, too. Yeah. Uh, same thing. Branching out, doing pretty much just what is the weirdest thing I can find. Oliver Twist with parkour is the weirdest <laughs> thing that you will see any of them in in the next two years. Uh, and, you know, what? because then people will look at that and go, oh, he was in that fucked up movie. It doesn't yeah. even matter right. what's in the movie. Sure. Oh, he was in that fucked up role in that fucked up movie. So you're movie. saying if I were a sparkly vampire and I wanted to get away from that, I should team up with, say, David Cronenberg? Allison has a great lounge. I'm just going to ignore you. A uh, great jazz. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes, no, precisely on. hit on my point. <laughs> Who's the weirdest director? Hey, Cronenberg. Hey, you want to make some of your uh, your really old stuff that's freaking everybody out? Yeah, some let's, sci-fi. Let's do that. Um, there's a great jazz lounge scene, which I used to be constantly on the hunt for and still am a uh, double feature show at gmail.com. This isn't so much at a jazz lounge as, um, a fancy ball or something. Hey, I think it's at like a, a, box a swell social. Party. It's a swell party. They're at a swell party, but man, you, you got the fucking, the jazz backdrop. Sure. Just like, I like it. You got the red curtain and the blue backlight. And I can just pretend that on the other side, 
there isn't a bunch of people eating wedding cake or it's whatever. It's a bunch of people in doing. dark tables smoking. And yeah, then when the camera pans back, it's Jennifer Connelly. Yeah. That's why we've paired it with road racers. <laughs> we, we've done oh it so you God. can turn around and it's smoking, uh, smoking, smoking, smoking. Yeah. Just, just a bunch of people smoking and you turn back and there's your red velvet. It's beautiful. No, you turn back around and there's an awkward makeout montage. That's what, yeah. that's what happens. That's the metaphor for John Waters here. There is actually an awkward makeout the, montage. In a here. lot of a lot of the uh, things that I like about Crybaby deal with the coupling within sure, the film. Sure, I know it's kind of a weird element to pick out. No, as not a at theme, all, man. But Crybaby is so much about coupling. Sure, you have. There's no single character. Mm. Even the the single characters are absolutely. There's um. What's her name? Lorna or Laura or whatever. The one who claims to have Crybaby's child. Yeah, right. She's this weird anomaly that is just a wrench. And then there's um uh the the blonde, the porn star. Sure. It's her character. She has a bunch of different guys, and that's basically the way to illustrate that she's single. Right. You know what I mean? But right. everybody else pairs up. Even the kids yeah. get paired up. The I feel like Wanda always has someone in the particular scene yeah, in the moment. Right, you know? exactly. And it's it's all about coupling. And I think a lot of that is supposed to be motivation for when they get separated right. and he goes to prison. I feel like it's such a driving force when everybody has been in pairs and sure. then your two leads can't have a pair. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it makes that whole arc seem really magnetic. Everybody else has somebody except yeah. these two people. You don't have anybody. The ones to... who, I mean, honestly, the ones who you feel like really deserve it. Sure. Because hatchet face, you're just like, you. <laughs> I mean, fortunately for you, but honestly, <laughs> come on. Right. And um, even hatchet face has someone. Yeah. How could these two in a not, world yeah. where. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you know, we're still getting a little bit of the racial tension from Hairspray. Oh, yeah. But the, they send they send all the black people to prison on a chicken wire truck. <laughs> sure. All right. We're getting a lot of the racial tension from Hairspray. But I mean, as the driving force of the film, um, it's about these groups that have been kind of segmented off. Sure. And it's interesting here compared to Hairspray because it's an artificial construct. Right. It's these two groups that, oh, maybe we're getting over racial tension but now we've actually just formed separate factions for sure. people to belong to, to go to war with each other. Right. Well, and it's a lot like uh, Dirty Shame with the uh, neuters and the sex addicts or whatever. Yeah, you're right. It is. But the thing that John Waters does, and I, I love him for it, is when somebody is a square, which to my knowledge, that was what cool hep cats called lame people back right. in the 50s. Sure. Um, That's still kind of it here, don't yeah, you think? But the squares are proud Right. I'm a square and I'm proud, you know, back to Dirty Shame. I'm a neuter and I'm okay with it. Yeah, right. I, I love that. It's there's high this, society. Th yeah, there's this pride in being this, this variant sect of humanity. Right, right. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit. Uh, it's sort of a Romeo and Juliet thing. Yeah, it's uh, sure. the family pride there. Uh, definitely the, you know, the lovers and the two factions. Yeah. But uh, here they have social taboos to overcome. And... Um, you know, kind of the idea of growing up and wondering what your parents will think. The parents also couples through this whole movie. Well, you, the parents were both all dead. Well, of the yeah, of the <laughs> the two protagonists, but they don't have each sure. other, and they don't even have parents. Right. But you know, you see everybody else's parents as couples. Sure, Patty There's Hearst, no, Mink Stoll. Right. That's where they kind of fit in. There's no single family homes here. Yeah. Everybody has yeah. someone, and it's all they're coupling. you know they're worried about what their parents would think, even their dead parents, I guess. Right. No, they are. That's why. That's why Crybaby cries, and that's uh, that's why she will only let him go to second base over the shirt. Yeah. Is second base touching the boob? I don't fucking that's know. That's what the film seemed to have taught me, is that touching a boob is second base. I feel like that at seems some like... point in our history we've covered yeah, this. no, I believe we have. I just don't if understand. If you remember where it was, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com, because I forget. Bases confuse me. Boob um, should be like ba first base. It should be like I'm, I'm leaning I'm going to send you our episode where we solved this. We probably didn't solve it back then. It's probably exactly what you're saying right now. I love the totally unnecessary backstories about their parents. Yeah. Took two planes for safety, <laughs> yeah. um, or that electricity makes him crazy. <laughs> yeah. Electricity killed my parents. He fucking rips open his shirt and has the electric chair, which is no more absurd than having a cross around your neck. Just no, two different execution devices. It's very true. If you're going to get a fucking religious tattoo on your chest, you go the Danny Trejo route. I think yeah. that's what you have to do. Now you tell me, because I think that there's an entire movie just in the Alphabet Bomber. 
Yeah, I, that could be a film, yeah, right? Maybe. Why is that not? You would see it right now. I imagine, would see Michael. It. It's twenty six vignettes, five minutes long, by twenty six different directors. I don't know, man. Well, One okay, bummer. yeah, that way, the way you just put it, <laughs> totally sold me. I would actually watch any movie divided into twenty six parts by twenty six different directors. Yeah, yeah. I mean, whether the hell yeah, whether they're five minutes long or it's a season of Fringe. Yeah, I that's... will watch something in twenty six parts. I don't know why that idea is appealing. Same to me, reason but it we've is. done Killapaloozas and now have to keep doing Killapaloozas. Oh God, something I don't watch a lot of is musicals. I yeah. think this counts as a musical. I think it does too. Right? I was thinking that halfway through. It's. Uh, I mean, the music always comes from somewhere. Yeah. So they, you know, that just makes it a smart musical. It's yeah, fine. Sure. They just they have to invent gags. They feel. Uh, no one spontaneously breaks out into song, but um, I mean, he's got a guitar, the radio's That's not on true. in there's the jailhouse. The there's the one scene where he does spontaneously break out into song, and it's when he hears the radio. And he starts singing. Well, but 21. that's what I mean is there's at least background music on yeah, the radio. Sure. I think the one scene that might count is Please Mr. Jailer. Yeah. You know, but it's still, it's outside. They're trying to get attention. They could be singing a song. I don't Who know. Knows? Um, it has to be hard to keep in character in that scene. Yeah. They go back into the prison and it's supposed to be a bunch of melancholy prisoners, but they're singing this funny song. Yeah. I mean, it is a bunch of melancholy prisoners. That's the awesome part. Yeah. Um, and they have to go in on set that day and lip sync the song and no one can go, wow, this is fucking ridiculous. That song also gets kind of hot at the end. Oh yeah. Where the women come in. Yeah. I, I love chair routines. I don't yeah. know why that's a, a fucking thing. Sure. I'm discovering is amazing. Even when John Waters does it. Just himself. <laughs> right. Right. John Waters <laughs> doing a chair routine or filming, you know, attractive people doing a chair routine. I'll take either one. I that's like the fine. first one a lot. Um, that'd be my alphabet bomber. Vignette for C. <laughs> God. Uh, so it's adapted. Um, this one was adapted for a stage musical was as it? well. Yeah, just like Hairspray. It hasn't made it full circle yet, but yet. I have my fingers crossed for a remake of the, an adaptation of the adaptation, I guess. Do you think Johnny Depp will play Hatchet Face? I just hope they have another courtroom scene because God knows I can't get enough of those. This might be the most ridiculous one yet, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, of the courtroom oh, scenes. Yeah. There's an iron lung. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Woman in an iron lung. It uh, does have a point, though. I mean, taxes on the very cigarette yeah. she's trying to smoke pay for the institution. Not bringing libertarian politics into the crybaby episode of Double Feature. Those same taxes pay for 3D glasses, I guess, in the prison. Yeah. So I don't know. Who knows where that money goes? 3D uh, glasses on a black and white film, by the way. Yeah. Pretty sure that's not sure. possible. No, it is Especially not with the color vision. Impossible, yeah. With Do you think they had yeah, smell vision work. in that? Uh, Probably. Odorama mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the prison when they watch that. Can we talk about the build of this fucking prison for just a second? I don't there's know what you're talking that, about. Something that drives me nuts. Oh, okay. you know. Oh, you know. Because there's been entire films based around the premise of you're stuck in prison. You're in the oh. hole. And you're in solitary confinement. How do you get out? Entire films, Michael, have been spent sure. on how do we break out of the... That was fucking Shawshank Redemption, uh -huh. right? Vast majority of that film, we're inside. Someday, maybe we'll get out. Turns out you could just use the manhole. Well, the, you'd think that, except he doesn't actually get out. Yeah, I he guess that's He never gets true. out. He just ends up in another room, and then all the guards think it's hilarious. Maybe they leave it loose because they know that there's no getting out through that sewer grate. All right, I guess it's I could see that. just rats and bones. Right, right. It does seem like, I mean, you had to, you know, as he's writing that scene, he has to kind of be laughing to himself. Sure. Oh, yeah. How does he get it? Well, I, I don't know. I guess there's a manhole. Yeah. It does say on the outside, they call it the hole. Mm -hmm. So they could be talking about the manhole inside. That's, that's the manhole inside. That's the title of a film somewhere. Title of another John Waters film is what it is. Didn't talk about the kids in the pet store or yeah. the, the pet oh, yeah, store sure. of children. Uh, and didn't talk about, uh, much like polyester, we have the unconventional phone conversation bubbles. Yeah. Here we have wavy dream bubbles. Yeah. Perfect. Outside of that, I feel like, uh, I feel like. I think you feel like some road racing. I do. I really do. There's this movie, right? It's called Road Racers. Now it's a, it's a movie. It's a made for TV movie. It used to be fucking nothing. And now it's uh, a movie. There's a book, right? It's, uh, I think it's called Road Racers, the making of a degenerate hot rod flick. Yeah. Online, this thing sells used for 75 bucks or something. Yeah. I do not have a copy of this Robert Rodriguez book. Double feature show at gmail.com. <laughs> if perhaps you've tripped over one and would like to send it to us, you would be my favorite fucking listener of all time. Favorite one. 
especially if I got like a nude Polaroid bookmark to put in there. Yeah. Okay. Point was that the film used to be as rare as this goddamn book. Yeah. You could not find this thing anywhere. I had a copy from a bad VHS tape and <laughs> until today, actually, that's the only way I'd ever seen the film. Yeah. Well, over it, and over shitty VHS tape. I was walking into a Best Buy for, uh, I think some, one of my friends was looking at video games, which is something that Best Buy is still legitimate for apparently. Uh, yeah, yeah maybe. Arguably. Unless you want to save $15 and buy it on Amazon, well, but that's but fine. But if you want it the day of, man on amazon you can pre-order it i guess that's true we also Point have a being. link to amazon on the website where you can order this road racers dvd yeah bringing it right back well but that's what i saw it at best buy i got it for five bucks wow yeah. nice it was in a you five dollar bin yeah road racers for five dollars i picked it up and i said road racers weird they made another this is that movie <laughs> yeah right i need to buy this well but then you paid chicago tax so it was actually 15 dollars. it was 15 and a half dollars god fucking hate chicago mm -hmm. tax so produced by Halloween's Deborah Hill. Uh, -huh. uh this is for Showtime's Rebel Highway series. It had I think it had a million dollar budget or it used a million. They gave him, you know, one point three million or something. And it took less than two weeks to make this thing. And this was in a series, um, yeah, you're pretty much right, made for T V movie. That's essentially what this is. Mm -hmm. It's part of this uh Rebel Highway series that Showtime did where they had a bunch of famous directors come in and each direct a movie. Was, weren't they all named after books? I think they were named... Yeah, I don't know or what they were Or were they all named, named after. after, like, old-school exploitation movies that disappeared? I think that it might be... Well, I remember the, the conceptual pitch was, let's take some B-movie glory that, and yeah. kind of give it a 90s edge. Yeah. But they were named after weird things, too. I think it was too. named after, like, pulp novels and old exploitation movies that oh, had cool titles we should know more about this series yeah. do you know who directed these other movies didn't, i i read through it didn't joe dante do one joe dante did one yeah yeah we have the director from uh henry portrait of a serial okay. killer did one um director from rock and roll high school did one no way ellen arkish director from the exorcist uh, and then the first one to come out was to be done by wes craven that's right i did read that wes craven Went off to do a new nightmare, uh -huh. thankfully. For the first time ever, thankfully, yeah. Wes Craven did a new nightmare. I will never say that again. And instead, we get Robert Rodriguez. So that would make this uh, pretty much the oldest Rodriguez movie we've ever covered. Yeah, well, there's only one older, and then Bedhead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> year 12 of Double Feature will be opening the with only Bedhead. Shorts, the only shorts year? Yeah, right. Year 12, we do exclusively short films. No, I think by year 12, that'll have been... Yeah. That'll, if we make it to a year 12, it'll be solely because we only That's do true. films under 10 minutes. Second half of year five, only short films. Oh, God. We're going to be, what, 50 by the time yeah. year 12? Is that how that math works? Oh, Jesus. So, I mean, I see a lot of his later work in this. I yeah. see, a, oh, I see yeah. mariachi and stuff in here, too, but... By end stuff, I mean bedhead. I, can't, I see mariachi and bedhead in here. That's just a lie at that point. Um, I see some mariachi stuff, but I see, you know, the older stuff. I see, you think about like the stage song, you know, opening yeah. on that stage song. That's that moment from Desperado. Yeah. That's clearly plucked out and got, I mean, Rodriguez is a resourceful guy. He knows they made this movie for TV. No one's seeing this movie. Yeah. Let's take some of these good ideas and let's sure. chuck them in other things. Uh, JT comes back and, yeah. you know, on Planet Terror. It's just, I mean, this film is a testament to his horrible naming skills. It is, it is. His yeah. horrible, wonderful naming skills. Yeah, the dude. Yeah, right? rock and roller. Oh, God. Um, there's also a lot of sex in while playing guitar. Guys there's trying there's to more play sex guitar while playing guitar than I think I've ever seen in a film. Yeah, well, unless you've seen Desperado and then... That's true. Uh, another protagonist playing guitar, too, aside while from fucking just... fucking Selma Hayek. Yeah, right, the Selma Hayek. A lot of... Uh, Scenes around the bar, too. Yeah. You Though know? this is the first time Selma Hayek has gotten fucked in a film. American film. American film. Thanks for that uh, Sorry, clarification. I I, we don't like foreign movies on Double Feature, so I'm completely unfamiliar with her non-English talkie work. That's sarcasm for our foreign listeners who don't <laughs> understand sarcasm. Wow, sorry, I can't say anything you nice. You just backhand dude. racist. I know. <laughs> racist. I know, do you like that? The you entire just backhand racisted. Our... No, 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 it's not racism if you do it to everyone but white people. Oh, Only okay. if you single out. This is, again, sarcasm. Sure. So much trouble. <laughs> white people have it pretty rough, man. Racism's a hard thing to deal with. Oh, God. So what I was saying was there's a lot of scenes in bars. I don't know why I was pointing that out. Desperado, I think. Yeah. 
you know, bars you, and diners, which is my favorite place. You have you have jazz clubs. That's I know that's your thing. Yeah, right. I wish every movie just took place as a conversation in a diner. If I think about it, like Twin Peaks, if you get me some fucking black coffee and pie, the little Splenda in there, I am a pussy. I will totally show up at a yeah, diner at I any just, point. Basically, I want every film to actually just be a recount of the events of the film between the two surviving people in the film at a diner, and then depending on their relationship, which you find out by the end of their their dialogue, sure, sure. they stand up and shoot each other, sure. they make out, one walks out, a car pulls up and everything goes black, you know, various and sundry. Sure. Well, Pi and Sucralose uh, put aside <laughs> for a moment. Um, I also want to talk about David Arquette. Oh my God. We've said before that Robert Rodriguez in his treasure trove of fucking skills can make anyone look boss and and apparently make them a good actor. Yeah. I guess it all is. it takes for David Arquette to be a good actor is to have him smoke regular cigarettes <laughs> instead of those funny cigarettes. And, and he is smoking the entire time. And that does not detract from how fucking bad. Except when he he's looks. lighting a cigarette. That's true. Or attempting trying to throw to, it in his mouth. Yeah. Light a cigarette. He, uh, yeah, he's heavy and brooding the entire film. So good. And uh, and he's really never looked like more of a badass. Would never look like more of a badass You didn't think he looked again. like a badass in Eight-Legged Freaks? Did you see The Tripper, by the way? The slasher film he directed? David Arquette directed? Yeah. No, I didn't even know about we this. We should check it out. It's pretty good. The Tripper. Yeah. Um, David Arquette and then Selma Hayek also went to directing, too. Yeah. This is far before that. You mentioned, uh, you know, first U.S. film. Yeah. This was actually her, her first time in uh, an American film. And... You know, not a huge film to start with, but immediately did Desperado after sure. this. So if this wasn't, you know, Rodriguez loves to talk about how he introduced the United States to Selma Hayek. Right. He was the one that paired up was, that love affair. Sure. And so if that wasn't Road Racers, it was Desperado. He gets double credit. No mm -hmm. one can attempt to steal that from him. She was uh, working in his movies for, you know, the first three or four of yeah. them. Before she really, before she really got a hit huge her stride and did Puss in Boots. Yeah, no, that was uh, what twenty years later or something. Yeah. Ten years later, yeah, twenty years. We also have the Link Ray song um, "Rumble" uh, before Tarantino would use it sure. at Jack Rabbit Slims uh -huh. in um, Pulp Fiction. Is Link Ray L Ray? Uh, yeah, right. No, uh, <laughs> I think that's generic enough that there's probably no connection there. Um, but maybe I don't know. What do I know? I do know that this is Rodriguez just checking off the boxes before yeah. these things ventured sure. out into, into other space. It's also a movie that's very much, you know, especially in his early days, I think it's still true now, but he's just obsessed with movies. Oh, yeah. Much like Tarantino. Yeah. Just loves movies, loves action stuff. This is his, you know, his fucking love letter to Invasion of the Body yeah. Snatchers. A movie that starts at 9, but really starts at 9.10. Mm-hmm. But I mean, think about that, you know, that cult movie love. He has to get in. Ah, but there's trailers. You yeah. want to see the trailers. There's three of them. And a newsreel even. Yeah. Rodriguez even loves fucking newsreels. Yeah. That's how much he's just a cinema guy. Also, before we before we move too far away from the people involved in the film, I want to mention John Hawks, who plays yeah. Nixer. Who is John Hawks? John Hawks, he was in, we saw him on the show in Me and You and Everyone We Know. Oh, and yeah. And also as the clerk who didn't say help us in From Dust Till Dawn. Sure, right. Um... <laughs> But he he was um he's been in a lot of uh, he's a in lot Deadwood, of films. right? Like he was he's great in Deadwood. Sure, sure. But he's uh he's a really solid character actor. He does a lot of um artistic roles. Me and you and everyone we know is very characteristic of the type of roles sure. he plays. You can't just throw out a word like artistic though. So what right. does that mean? Well, I mean he he does a lot of um. I guess indie type a lot of uh oh artsy films <laughs> yeah so, I guess artsy so that is what you mean but um he lends that same element to road racers yeah because he's sitting there with the fucking fry yeah. on the toothpick yeah doing his John Hawks thing sure that's sure. a John Hawks spiel like that's that's where he lives right, right. in the cinema world where it gets profound for a few minutes yeah and he's uh he feels so natural good. though because he's a crazy kid yeah and he's so good in this film he brings along a lot of those invasion of the body yeah. snatchers points yeah the invasion of body snatchers thing and again we have no fucking idea what we're ever talking about but I believe that the whole thing is kind of a commentary on almost what we did last year with Glengarry Glen Ross and Shaun of the Dead. It's kind of a commentary on people 
not ever getting out of the world right. that they're in and them just being surrounded and trapped by these people who aren't even really people anymore. Yeah. And it's kind of a testament to rebellion against all there is to go back to Hellride. Um, I mean, it ends up climaxing when he finds out that they're lip syncing at the, the sure. last night at the bar. Sure. And he freaks out and says, there's a record playing in here. It's starting or something like yeah, that. Right, and, right. and he's just paranoid. Pod and people, he's, man. It's yeah. Pod people. And he's so hooked on the idea of not giving in to this society that when dude leaves, he's officially, he feels like he's lost. He feels yeah. like the last non pod person is sure. leaving town and he's left to fend for himself. He says, if there's not some kind of, what is it? Not some kind of, basically fighting. If there's not yeah. some kind of misbehaving. I don't know what to do. I sure. go crazy. Right, right. And that's him latching onto the counterculture. That's yeah. him latching onto going against the norm. Sure. But he can't perform that. He's not that guy. He just likes knowing it's there so that he doesn't feel like the world is lost. Yeah, you know, the main characters want an escape plan. Yeah. That's why they sort of latch onto that band. Um, that's Selma Hayek's character. You know, that's her big plan mm -hmm. is, hey, what about these guys? Have you seen this over here? That could be our ticket out. It's uh, it's also way Cemetery Junction. Oh, yeah. You remember that? Yeah. That's what we were talking about there is just being stuck in this one place left to die there. Born, lived, died. One fucking spot. And kind of wondering, isn't there anything more to your life? Are you ever going to get out of this town? It gets heavy, not even the metaphor of the French fry, but then literally JT brings it down even more. Mm -hmm. uh, you think he's going to do something funny, dip the French fry, eat it, but uh, he's fucking dipping that fry talking about, actually, you're going to die probably in that seat, probably eating my burger. Not even probably. Yeah. You will die in that seat eating my burger. Yeah. You're never going to leave or amount to anything is basically what he's saying. And it's terrifying having uh, not only no legacy, but not even really living a life yeah. at all. And so that's pod people. That's all these people in this town of a variety of ages. They're there at a variety of ages because they've all accepted that that's just where they live mm -hmm. and that's it. And that's all there is to it. And they're satisfied. Our main characters want to get out of there. Yeah. So that's kind of the message that's being accomplished with this script. And it's a, a very sort of... Um, I mean, you see similar threads in other Rodriguez movies, but I think there's other things in the, the writing that kind of give away, you know, he, uh, where you see his hand. He mm -hmm. wrote this with Tommy Nix, who shows up in the movie. I think he's a drummer in one of the scenes. Yeah. He, he was has also, a, he was also the, uh, the, one of the doctors in Planet Terror. Yeah, for sure. That points at the skull that's been hollowed out. He's got parts in a lot of Rodriguez oh, movies. Oh yeah, you're right. He's all over. You know, he's uh he was a classmate or something or Rodriguez's. So he shows up, he's one of you know, the guy's friends that shows up in all these movies. But um you also see a movie that's written a lot around icons. Has the sort of mariachi humor yeah. of you know, like using the hair grease to slick the <laughs> the fucking roller rink. Um the idea at the time when Rodriguez wrote his other book, um, Rebel Without a Crew, one that is available and that I have read, he talks a lot about the way he keeps his budget super low. Only 7000 on Mariachi compared to a million here, but still right. you know, has that mindset of, I want to accomplish as much as I can with my tiny budget. Um, so you know, trying to stretch that out as much as you can, you come up with these icons, you work backwards. You go, um, what do I have access to? And so in Mariachi, that was huge. And maybe we'll talk about that one day when we finally figure out what the hell to do about Mariachi. But, uh, you know, oh, we got access to a car. We know the local, I don't know, police or whatever. Mm -hmm. We have a guitar case. How, how do we build a movie out of the stuff we have? And so with Road Racers, yeah, you have a guitar and, you know, uh, you can exploit cars i guess because that's kind of what what showtime's around for that shouldn't be too hard uh you have that matte black uh chevy from two lane black yeah the two lane black top 55 fucking great but also the grease i mean that's an easy thing you oh, know yeah. so we're gonna make a movie about greasers uh let's exploit the grease let's make that a thing so you know you see that as part of the style you see him greasing his hair there's a whole fucking scene of that mm -hmm. um you see him later make the joke of greasing the roller rink yeah. out of the hair you're exploiting an item you have even with his wider access 
and uh, budget than Mariachi and you know these earlier films he did. That mindset stayed with him throughout all his work. Mm -hmm. You can see that again in uh, yeah, I mean Cherry Darling from you yeah. mentioned Planet Terror. She has a gun for a leg. Everything in that movie is about having a fucking gun for a leg. It's on the poster. It's the icon. It's the movie that has a chick with a gun for a leg. Sure, you'd know that easy probably to before Planet Terror. Yeah. But then there's also, I mean, Machete. I don't yeah. even need to say anything about that, right? Or is short, The Misbehaviors. Yeah. You know, just so iconic. That's titular. It's what it's about. It's high concept. And that drives everything in it. Oh, what was that one called? Oh, The Misbehaviors. Yeah. I mean, his movies are built for festivals. Sure. Oh, I went and saw a bunch of things. What was that one called? Bedhead. It was about the girl. She's got the crazy hair, weird yeah. powers. Bedhead. But, and maybe this is just because I'm a fan of his stuff. I've seen a lot of his work. Uh, I feel like you can identify it by the editing, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? There's this sort of uh, knife scene, right? Yeah. Early on, knife, 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 shoe, cleaver. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there's a little bit of uh, quippy dialogue, and then bam, cleaver out. Yep. It's uh, it's cut together. I mean, it's essentially a Mexican standoff. Yeah. There's tons of those in this movie. Um, the scenes he shoots later of, you know, the car... I mean, smoking and the car, all the car driving stuff, but especially at the, the very, very end when it sombers down a bit, it's Sin City. Yeah. It looks the same way when people have their hair slicked back and they're smoking, driving around Sin City. You know, that hasn't changed a bit, um, except earlier in that scene, stylistically, he's just bloody and it's a, it's a fucking bat out of hell scene. Mm -hmm. I love just how frenetic and crazy that is. Yeah. The, fucking fiery look in his eyes it's one of the things that makes david arquette look like a badass yeah. in this movie so this was actually the last robert rodriguez movie i'd seen i hadn't seen it till i bought it on dvd oh really um, oh wow so recently very recently oh that's cool and i remember you mentioning having seen it and we were going to watch it and then one of one or both of us simultaneously forgot and i asked you how it was you said yeah it's good but when i went and finally watched it mm -hmm. it's like one of the best ones <laughs> So this is uh, maybe one of your favorite Rodriguez well, movies. Well, I mean, think about it. Robert Rodriguez, who is easily like my top three directors, sure. makes a movie about fast cars. Yeah, right. And I finally see that one. Well, I saw it. The first time I saw it was way before the road exploitation yeah. stuff. And you'll have to forgive me. I would have harped on you. I thought you had seen it. Yeah, I just uh, faced and then I kind of gave up. And Well, there's a lot of movies. Vroom, vroom, chop, chop. There are. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to get to. That list just keeps increasing of uh, stuff you promised yourself you'd see. Yeah, it um it just had this glorious DVD release after yeah. not coming out for so long. Now, uh, and the DVD is great. It's got a commentary on it. Uh, he totally retimed the color. That's what does that phrase even mean? Sorry, that's a it's like film jargon that I just slipped into. Yeah. I don't know what the fuck happened. <laughs> he made the color look good. Right, uh -huh. it's digitally remastered, recolored. I guess I don't even know if it's fully recolored. Yeah. I think they just worked on it. Um, you can actually see it in widescreen yeah. now even though up to this point it was always... I mean, I only had the one bootleg. I don't know if other stuff sure. leaked out over time. It was released uh, at least for a little while in another country on DVD. So here we have this really clean copy. You can get it in high definition. There's not only a commentary on it, There's but a film school. another yeah. Robert Rodriguez 10-minute film school. Uh, so if you haven't seen Road Racers up to this point, I mean, there's basically never been a better time to check yeah. this movie out. We will be looking at two more movies on the show uh, next week. That's right. But before then, there's more housekeeping to do. You mean uh, doublefeatureshow.com? That's a place you can go, yeah. And doublefeatureshow at gmail.com? You can go on the website, and if you buy Road Racers through our website, we get probably about five cents out of that. Oh, my God. But if enough people do it, we could have a dollar. A dollar. Yeah, we could. That's I like how we both uh, realized uh, what would be the most a obtainable fucking goal. dollar, I believe. We is... said, what was the most obtainable goal? Yeah. 60 cents. Let's round that up. One dollar. Yeah. Great. Uh, what are we doing next time on the next show? Next time we're going to do, uh, well, we're going to do an actual Splat Pack director and our honorary nomination for a new Splat Pack director. Sure. Great. Uh, we're going to do Rogue, which is Greg McLean. Love it. We did uh, his movie. Wolf Creek. Great. The Australian Splat yeah, Pack director. Yeah, that was right. That was right. And then we're going to do the new Ty West film, The Innkeepers. Oh, Ty West that. of Cabin Fever 2 and House of the Devil fame. Which were both fantastic movies, so I assume we are in for a good time Gotta next week. Gotta be good, so watch more fucking film. Bye.